thing I'm going to do is have Tim introduce our guest speaker. This will come first tonight, then we'll come to the meeting. Yeah, so it's a real pleasure. We got uh, Alex Fallon, who's the Director of Government Relations for General Fusion. He's going to give us a presentation on uh, one of the world's leading edge technologies or uh, companies for fusion technology right here in Burnaby, General Fusion, and they've just done a TED Talk at the convention. And so Alex is going to give us a little presentation, and then we're hoping to arrange a tour. Uh, what we're shooting for is Saturday morning right now, but uh, we've yet to confirm that. So Alex and I are going to work on that tonight, tomorrow. All right, so perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you to tonight. Thanks, Tim, for arranging this. Uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm Alex Fallon, Director of Government Relations for General Fusion. Uh, a company that I think is one of the most interesting companies in, in the world, actually. And uh, I don't say that lightly, but it really is uh, trying to change uh, the planet by developing clean, safe energy, by using fusion energy. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a second. Um, a couple disclaimers before I start. Uh, the first is I don't have a technical background. Uh, my background is actually commerce and law. Uh, so normally we would have one of our engineers or technical people deliver the talk to a group like yourselves tonight, but uh, my boss is, is tied up, so we uh, tapped on the shoulder and said, Alex, you're doing it. So, so here I am. Uh, the second thing is I, I thought it'd be a good idea to come down to the pub early today. Uh, so I sat in the pub for a couple hours just doing some work, getting ready for the presentation uh, this evening. And uh, that sounded like a, a good idea, but after about my fourth or fifth pint, it probably wasn't the wisest <laughs> move. So, uh, so uh, hopefully this was okay today. Uh, what I want to do really is, is tell you a bit about uh, fusion energy, uh, tell you a bit about general fusion, and tell you about how we think we can ultimately change uh, the world's use of, of, of energy. Uh, before I start, though, um, how many of you are familiar with fusion? With fusion energy? A couple. Uh, how many of you had heard of uh, General Fusion before this talk was set up? Two, three, three, four, maybe? Okay. Okay, good. Any fusion experts in the room? Okay. Good. <laughs> I always ask that. Excellent. Okay, so you'll believe what I tell you. Good. Um, I want to try to keep this pretty informal, so ask questions as I go. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of uh, run a 30 second uh, kind of commercial about General Fusion just to give you an intro to the company, set the scene. Uh, going to give you a quick slide talk, 10 slides maximum, keep it short and sweet, and then run the uh, TED talk which went up about five hours ago on the TED website. And in five hours we hit about 50,000 views from across the world. 50,000 views in, in a few hours. So we've been pretty excited for our company and for our uh, Fusion Energy. I just quickly introduce, introduce myself a bit. Um, I'm relatively new to BC. I spent most of my life in, uh, in the UK and then in, in Saskatchewan. And I was where Saskatoon was home. I was working for the government of Saskatchewan. Had a nice, comfortable, cushy, easy uh, government job. Uh, probably highly overpaid, underworked. Uh, nice lifestyle in Saskatoon. It took me about eight minutes to drive to work. And um, my job was to travel the world and promote Saskatchewan to attract investment and help grow the economy. So had what many would consider, uh, would consider being a, a dream job, and it was great fun. And one day, I was you know, looking at jobs, seeing what's out there. My wife and I have two young kids, and we were thinking of moving to British Columbia. And uh, at the government of Saskatchewan, I did a lot of work in the uranium sector, and before that, in the UK, I worked for a nuclear energy company. So I sat down in front of my laptop, and I you know, started looking for jobs in BC, and, Type in government jobs, there weren't too many of those. Uh, so, and then I thought, well, I'll type in nuclear energy, British Columbia, and see what comes up. Expecting nothing to come up, right? BC is a really nuclear province, like say Ontario or the New Brunswick or Quebec is. Uh, so I typed that up and sat on my computer, and one result came up. And uh, that was a, with a company called General Fusion. Uh, I'd been in the nuclear industry, uranium industry, a long time, and never heard of General Fusion. I'd heard a bit about fusion energy, but didn't really believe it was ever going to happen. So I looked at this job posting for this company called General Fusion, trying to do nuclear fusion in Burnaby, BC, uh, and I just basically ignored it. I just pressed delete, basically. And it kept niggling away at me, like, really? Is there really a company in Burnaby trying to crack fusion energy? Something that uh, the world hasn't achieved yet. Governments, the Russian, the 
Russians, the Chinese, the Americans, the Brits have put billions of dollars into trying to do fusion energy, and it hasn't worked yet. And then you have the small private company in Burnaby uh, trying to do it with about 65 people and a few million dollars, and um, kind of dismiss it as a bit of a wasn't going to happen, right? And um, so I left it for a few days, and then I kept going back to it, looked at the company a bit more, looked at their technology, looked at some of their investors, some of the people on their board of directors, and, and got a bit more interested. So I met with them and, and got a tour and really loved what they're trying to do, really one of the companies that is trying to change the world. So uh, I remember phoning, my, phoning up my dad and saying, yeah, I'm quitting my government Saskatchewan job. Uh, moving to BC to work for a fusion company in Burnaby. Got two little kids. Uh, the company's only got a few months of money left. Uh, half the people, you, well, most of the people you talk to think this company is crazy and, and isn't going to achieve much. And, um, and I, I leave for BC in a week's time. And my dad thought I was joking. And when I told him I'm not joking, he told me not to do it. But anyway, I did it. And the reason why I did it is you'll see hope as I go through today's presentation. Is because, like I said, I really think General Fusion is one of the most interesting companies in the world, period. Um, what they're trying to do is difficult. There's probably a 50-50 chance whether it works or not. Um, you know, if it doesn't work, that's not a huge failure. I mean, it's amazing that people are trying to do this. So I think it's a great kind of scientific uh, technology and business entrepreneurship endeavor they're taking. And they're doing amazingly well for, for such a small company. And 12 years later, they're still around. So that says something about the progress they're making. So that's a bit about me and how I came to General Fusion. Uh, I'll start with the little clip that introduces General Fusion and just tries to tell like, you a little bit about uh, what we're trying to do. Hopefully this will work. What if you've been part of this group of visionaries and technology leaders? And what if together you could accomplish something exciting? Who knows? Why don't you just shape the future? ourselves as an innovative technology company, you know, similar to trying to go to the moon, um, uh, you know, the Wright Brothers developing flight, you know, all those kind of groundbreaking innovative technology advancements, it's something we're trying to do with Fusion. Uh, so it's kind of getting that mindset that, yeah, we know Fusion hasn't been done yet, we know everyone says it can't be done, but uh, we, want to do the, we want to be the people who crack it, and if we do, um, you know, it's a huge success story, change the world don't well it was worth a shot right so, so that's kind of what we're, we're all about okay so and can anyone here explain what fusion is it's fusion anyone have a guess joining the particles something rubbing together close joining rubbing particles together close any other guesses splitting them, splitting them. Kind of close. Okay, uh, so uh, I guess the way to describe it is if you think of uh, nuclear energy at the moment, right? nuclear reactors and nuclear energy. There's 22 nuclear reactors in Canada, 420 nuclear nuclear power plants around the world, and they all use uranium. They take uranium atoms and they basically split the atom. That generates a lot of heat. You can use that heat to boil water, create steam, etc. So you the atomic bomb or nuclear reactor. It's all about splitting the atoms, right? And the, for hundreds of years, mankind thought the atom was the smallest part all you could get, and you couldn't divide the atom. Along comes the, uh, World War II, the arms race, the Manhattan Project, atomic race, and lo and behold, all this government funding and money and effort goes into it. They learn how to crack the atom, and that creates nuclear energy, nuclear bombs, basically. Okay, so that's kind of the, the uh, comparison. Uh, and, and it's funny, you know, when you think of fusion, people saying you can't do fusion. You think about nuclear fission or splitting uranium atoms, and people said you could do that for hundreds of years. It's never going to be done, and then in you know, 1949, uh, the atomic bomb, right? So it um, just shows you that with the right amount of effort, time, and money, you know, anything hopefully, potentially is possible. 
So fusion is, is similar but different. Uh, similar in that it's a nuclear process, and by that I mean it has to do with, with, uh, with changing the nucleus uh, of an atom. And that's, that's why it's a nuclear process. Uh, whereas, so fission is about splitting the atoms, fusion is about fusing atoms together. So it's taking two different atoms and fusing them together, getting them to join, and if you can do that, uh, you can create a huge amount of heat and energy. And use that to boil water, uh, create steam, etc. Uh, so fusion is actually how the sun generates heat at the moment, right? The, the sun is basically a big, huge ball of fusion, fusion energy. Uh, it's so hot, it's fusing together atoms all the time, and it's creating uh, heat and energy. So basically, what we're trying to do with fusion energy is, is recreate what the sun does, which is why it's so hard to do, right? It's, it's messing with mother nature and atoms and all those type of things. So, so it's hard to do. Okay, so here, here's an example. So uh, with, with fusion, you're basically taking hydrogen isotopes. Uh, in this case, to do fusion energy, the best thing to use is deuterium and tritium. So heavy water, uh, basically hydrogen isotopes can be extracted from the sea. And fusing to them together under, uh, and the way you do that is enormous heat and pressure. We need to get to about the temperature of the sun. So we need, in order to do fusion, we need to heat those isotopes to about 140 million degrees Celsius. So pretty hot, right? Um, and if those atoms fuse together, it basically releases helium. So pretty safe, it's not releasing plutonium or, or highly radioactive uh, material like a nuclear reactor would, and you get the neutron uh, which can be used to uh, as a heat source basically. Okay, so fusion, all about fusing atoms together and creating energy. And to do that you've got to get, get to 140 million degrees Celsius. So we have some plasma injectors which I'll talk about in a second at General Fusion at our office in Burnaby just down the road. Anyone want to take a guess what temperature we're up to at the moment? Four million degrees Celsius in our uh, facility in Burnaby, uh, working on that every day. So pretty. pretty oh, you what's it? your casing made out of? I need to hold it. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come to that. I'm, I should, I'm jumping ahead, but I'll come back to that. Good question. Four million. Oh, okay. Uh, we uh, we have um, uh, again. I'll, let me come to that because I'll I'll get too far ahead of myself. Uh, so the thing about fusion is. You need a small amount of fuel to get a huge, a very dense fuel, a huge amount of energy you need. So, uh, what have we got here? Uh, 60 kilograms of fusion fuel is equal to 400,000 tons of coal, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine the uh, e efficiency of fusion fuel compared to other energy sources. And there, there's some more benefits of fusion as well. So, but just to give you a sense of small, tiny amount of fusion fuel, hydrogen isotopes, water basically, give you enough energy as 400,000 tons of coal. It's pretty amazing we can achieve this. Okay, a couple other benefits of, of fusion. You know, why, why is a company like General Fusion trying to do this? Why is the world trying to develop fusion energy? It's really because of the benefits of fusion energy. So the first one is unlimited. So as I mentioned, the fuel for fusion energy is hydrogen isotopes of water be attracted from seawater, so there's enough fusion fuel, if you think of it as a fuel, to last the world for billions and billions of years, right? We can power the entire planet on fusion energy for billions of years, and there'd be plenty of fusion fuel, hydrogen isotopes left over, right? It's not like uranium or coal or, or, or natural resources. Um, uh, so abundant and limited, pretty much the same thing. The other point on limited is it's a, it's a base load energy source, right? It's, doesn't require the wind to blow like like uh, wind power or tidal power or something like that, right? It's unlimited energy, run 24/7 all around the world. Uh, clean energy for pretty much everyone. Um, the other thing about abundant is you know it doesn't rely on a natural resource. So we like to think of fusion as a uh, knowledge-based resource, knowledge-based energy. If you have the knowledge technology to do fusion fuel, you can do it. You can do it in Africa. You can do it anywhere. Basically, so don't need not associated to a resource like coal or oil and gas, and it would solve a lot of the geopolitical issues with uh, energy industry at the moment. Uh, it's clean, so releases basically zero pollution, no CO2 gases, um, doesn't create nuclear waste, and it's a clean energy source. It's, it's, uh, it releases, as we saw, a small amount of helium, not very dangerous, and neutrons which we use to, uh, to uh, uh, as the heat. 
small amount of, of tritium, uh, which is a radioactive isotope, and uh, you know, it is a nuclear pro process, so the reactor would get activation, it would be radioactive, but not highly radioactive among lived radioactive waste like you get with nuclear power plants. So it would be similar to uh, you know, a nuclear medicine facility in a hospital. You know, it's radioactive, but just small doses. Uh, and Say the best way to show that is to compare it to nuclear energy. So nuclear energy, nuclear reactors at the moment use uranium as a fuel. They split the uranium atom. Uh, you get a lot of radioactive waste. You get plutonium. You get all these dangerous uh, radioactive material. Uh, after you burn that uranium in a nuclear reactor, you're left with uh, spent fuel or nuclear waste, which is radioactive, highly radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years, and needs to be stored uh, below water, then in casket, and at some point, this nuclear waste is going to be buried in a repository underground in Canada and all the other countries that have nuclear power. So, 42 countries around the world, I think it is. Also, with nuclear reactors, um, with uh, nuclear reactors and uranium, uh, fission is basically a runaway process, right? So, you split the atom, cause that chain reaction, and it's a runaway process, and if you don't control it, can get this explosion. So if you don't keep the reactor cool enough or something goes wrong, you get a nuclear meltdown, nuclear explosion, which we saw with Chernobyl. Um, and there was a risk of that with the Fukushima accident as well, with the reactor getting too hot because they couldn't keep it cool. So, you know, you think of these negative uh, aspects of nuclear energy, they don't apply to fusion. Instead of uranium, we're using water. Uh, there's no highly long-lived radioactive waste. We're using a small amount of hydrogen isotopes and there's no chance of a meltdown because it's not a runaway process. Here you're trying to fuse it together, so if things stop fusing together, nothing happens, you just you don't get any energy. So, uh, you know, one of the issues we're facing as a company is this whole nuclear discussion. You know, as soon as you say nuclear fusion and a nuclear reactor, even though we call it a nuclear power plant, people go, whoa, nuclear, and we it's like, well, actually it's very different. It's a nuclear process, but it's not like the nuclear energy that we we know, right? When we think of nuclear energy, we think of fission, not fusion. Um, some of you, you know, may have heard of fusion over the years. It's, it's, you know, the joke of fusion is that it's always 30 years away. You know, the thought it was coming in the 50s, 60s, 70s, etc., etc. It's always been, been years away, um, which is true. Uh, we haven't cracked it yet. But what this graph tries to show is the progress that we've been making with fusion energy in terms of trying to get to that temperature, right? You need to get to 140 million degrees to fuse those atoms together. And over the years, uh, we've been getting closer and closer and closer. And we did an interesting, you'll see it on the TED Talk, we did an interesting comparison where we showed the Moore's Law, which is the semiconductor uh, improvements, um, versus uh, the fusion progress. And it's pretty similar. So fusion energy is developing at a scale similar or at a pace. Similar to, uh, to Moore's Law semiconductors. Uh, so, not there yet, but getting closer and closer. And remember, you know, this is only decades of research for a technology that could potentially solve the world's energy problems. So, you know, the fact that it's 10, 20, 30, 40 years behind schedule, well, if we crack it, no one will be remembering that, right? So, it's, uh, it's worth waiting for. So, and we're getting closer. Yeah? It's a great deal to refer to, um, you know, you have that reaction, I assume you're putting energy. Yeah. So obviously it comes to a point where you have to put so much energy into it so you finally get the temperature you need and you're actually getting more energy out of it before you end the break even. That's the perfect definition, yeah. If you can record that and send it to me, that'd be great. That, that's the perfect definition. And, and that's an actually a very good point because, uh, you know, you, uh, we can do fusion now, right? 14-year-old kids have done fusion experiments. Um, these large uh, fusion research projects around the world are doing fusion. Uh, and the problem when we say we can't do fusion, what we mean by that is we can't get net gain or break even, which is getting more energy out than we put in. So, you know, to get to that temperature, you've got to dump in a load of energy, uh, which we can do, but we're getting a small amount of energy out. And that recently just happened at uh, a fusion research facility in the U.S. a couple months ago. There's a big announcement in California. In California. Uh, so the the the. Uh, Fusion fuel or the pellet actually released more energy than it was absorbed by the pellet, but actually took tons of lasers, much more laser energy uh, to heat up that pellet than the energy that was absorbed by it and then the energy that was released. So, the challenge is that kind of that net gain. Yeah, good, good one. Thanks for it. So, we're, we're, we're getting closer, and it's a bit of a race to see who gets there first. 
So, uh, so general fusion. So there's a couple of large fusion research projects around the world, and I'll talk to you about those in a second. There's only two private sector fusion energy companies, one of them being general fusion in, in Burnaby. And uh, a couple of things. We, our focus is on demonstrating net, net gain, which everyone wants to do with fusion to show that it's a, a, a viable energy source. More important than that, though, we want to do it in an economically viable way and we want to get it commercialized in short time scales. And those are important points because as you'll see over the next few slides, there are these large billion dollar fusion energy projects around the world, which are great, but let's say they hit net gain or break even next year or five years from now. They still have a large problem in that they haven't designed themselves to then be a power plant, right? They, they just demonstrated net gain and, that, and that's about it. And then they would stop that project, which has cost billions of dollars and decades and then try and build a power plant using that technology. Where General Fusion is different is we're developing, our, our technology is, is being developed uh, in parallel to developing a power plant at the same time. So basically all of us, so we're trying to demonstrate net gain, but also show that we've got a, a, a power plant built into that design. So if we achieve net gain, we're ready to go with the power plant. Whereas the others are, are years away from then building a power plant. And I'll talk more about that in a second too. Um, so General Fusion started in, uh, in a garage on Bowen Island by one guy, a guy called Dr. Michel Laberge. Uh, he uh, born in Quebec. He did uh, physics and uh, PhD in physics and plasma physics, and then he joined a company in Vancouver called Crayo Products. Are you familiar with that? Crayo basically developed laser printing. I think it started with a few employees. Uh, Michelle was employee number five or six, I think, and he basically helped develop laser printing. Uh, he was at that company for many years, and that company grew and grew. I think it got to about 6,000 employees or so. And one day Kodak came along and bought the company for $1.5 billion. They were just across the street, actually. Oh, were they really? No way. Yeah, never knew that. Apparently, they're, they're BC's largest um, kind of uh, buyout ever, right? Small company started with a few people, got bought, bought by Kodak. Yeah. The founder? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great company. They don't make a lot of money in science, probably. No way. Okay. Yeah, fantastic company. And Michelle was, uh, like I said, employee number four or five, something like that. He was about 40 years old, and he sat in his office, and he didn't like this the way Creo was now becoming part of this big, huge company, right? And uh, he sat at his desk one day, and he said, well, you know, every year you're putting these share, pieces of share options in the desk, and just, and so once the company got bought out, he opened his drawer, looked at these share options, and he was like, holy crap, <laughs> I can basically retire. So he's 40 years old, cashed in his shares, left the company, uh, went to uh, relax on Bowen Island, and, um, you know, basically as he says, he had a bit of a midlife crisis, right? He was 40 years old, he'd been developing laser printing technology, so he could print more junk mail cheaply. Um, made a lot of money with this company, he's 40 years old, sat on his couch with his thumbs. <coughs> and what he did, but his background was, was fusion science and physics and plasma physics. So he decided to go back to his roots and try and look at uh, fusion technology. So he spent several months uh, just researching all the different fusion projects around the world and, and seeing what could work and if there are any, any gaps. And he came across this um, technology called the Linus uh, fusion technology which isn't something General Fusion uh, has, has developed. It was something that the U.S. government started in the 60s or 70s at the U.S. Naval Facility. And it was a way to infusion by compression, which is what General Fusion did. And this technology, you know, a lot of money went into it, uh, the U.S. Navy, uh, but it eventually got put on a shelf because they could never get the time, you know, the pistons uh, to, the, uh, to the accuracy of it. They couldn't control the timing to what they needed to kind of create this, uh, this systematic compression. Michelle looked at that technology and was like, wow, you know, with advances nowadays in, in plasma physics, lasers, semiconductors, computing systems, material science, I wonder if we could kind of re, re engineer that technology, use innovation and try to redevelop it. And that's exactly what he's been doing with General Fusion. So, started General Fusion with his own money, friends and family, some former employees of Creo invested, he borrowed money from friends and family, and set up General Fusion in 2002, basically in the graph. <coughs> and worked on his, his first few experiments. Uh, which took many years, and uh, now, you know, 12 years later, 65 people, uh, 12 PhDs, uh, raised about $60 million of, of funding because of our kind of proof of concept.
concept and the technology path we're on. Uh, so how did we do that? Uh, started off with a bit of money from um, you know, Government Canada, National Research Council, IRAP, you know, and, and others. A couple of things I want to point out here, I'm going to so so I'll rush through this, but um, you know, investments from, from entrepreneurial support agencies like BBC Canada, you know, that's fantastic for sure. Then you look at other ones like Synovus Energy, right? Billion dollar oil and gas company in Alberta, you know, they've invested a significant amount of money in general fusion. So when I was you know, back in Saskatchewan looking at joining General Fusion, couldn't figure out if these guys were for real or not, or you know, was it what was the percentage they were going to succeed? Was it one percent or fifty percent? I see a company like Synovus Energy has put their technical experts on this, then they do diligence, look through uh, you know, General Fusion fine tooth code, and decide to invest you know, millions of dollars. That was a good enough reason for me to kind of take a shot at, at being part of this. Um, then one, uh, one day, Michelle got a call from Jeff Bezos. I don't know who Jeff Bezos is. Sorry? Amazon. Yeah, founder of Amazon. So America's 16th richest guy, $32 billion net worth. He phoned up Michelle and said, hi, it's Jeff Bezos. I'd like to invest in your company. And, uh, you know, another amazing type of investor, right? And th those are the type of people who, who believe uh, this could work. And, and other investors as well. Another thing I looked at was, was the board of directors. You know, this company started with Michelle and his money he cashed in from his company. Now we've got some heavy haters on our board of directors or an advisor council, Carol Brown, who's uh, Obama's energy czar, um, you know, former director of GE Energy, uh, chief marketing officer of GE Energy, uh, you know, senior people from uh, Reva, the world's largest nuclear company, Bechtel, etc. Point of this is, if these smart people are willing to put their name, reputation, and time into General Fusion, who am I to say that? You know, these guys think there's a shot at achieving fusion. So here I am. Also got a lot of partnerships uh, with different universities, Government of Canada, uh, our investors, Queen's University, and, and a lot of the research facilities around the world as well. So there, there's kind of there's two. Um, there's a couple of big fusion projects going on in the world at the moment. We'll start with ITER, which is a large uh, uh, project in France being funded by about eight different countries. Uh, all the European countries, China, the US, uh, different countries as well. Billion dollar project. They're now constructing a site to develop a fusion reactor in France. So, you know, say fusion isn't coming, you know, they look at this project and say, well, these governments are investing billions of dollars in fusion technology. They're, uh, building a site as we speak now to construct a fusion reactor, so you know, eventually we will get there. So it's not a case of if fusion happens, I think it's a case of when, like 10, 20 years, hopefully general fusion uh, beats everyone. Uh, and you've got the National Ignition Facility in the, in the US, which achieved this kind of minor breakthrough a few months ago. Um, and they use three football fields of, of lasers, the world's highest power lasers, to try and heat their fuel to fusion conditions. Uh, point that out, this is the example of that whole power plant issue, right? So you've got a, uh, a facility that costs billions of dollars and years, decades to build, uh, the world's high, highest powered lasers. So if they hit net gain, you can't really then go and build a power plant, you know, six months later, a year later, because it's not cost effective. You know, you can't just, BC Hydro can't go and, and invest billions of dollars in, in uh, laser technology and build one of these facilities, right? It needs to be turned into a commercial commercially viable power plant. Same with, with ITER, you know, billions of dollars, decades. The whole purpose of these two experiments is just to show net gain. We've got General Fusion in the middle, who is uh, you know, going for net gain, but at the same time developing it as a power plant and as a nuclear fusion uh, reactor. So uh, these ones use uh, high power lasers, and this uses, uses a big uh, magnetic confinement uh, to do the fusion, which I'll talk about in a second too. Kind of in the middle. Yeah. What kind of uh, geographical um, action are you looking for there? Is it like per city? Is it per yeah. province? Good question. Uh, our design at the moment is for 100 megawatts, um, so about the size of a large house. You know, each city would need a few of those, I, I guess. I'm not sure about city size of Vancouver, but uh, we have lots of these facilities, so yeah, a few per city type of thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there is that issue of, well, you know, could we make large ones, could we make small ones for remote communities? I think once we were able to crack fusion in that game, we could design them large or small, but 
At the moment, we're based on a 100 megawatt power plant. What do you expect from the capital expenditure point of view for investment? Yeah, um, I'm being filmed, but this is off the record, I guess. Uh, I think our CEO has been quoted as saying about uh, we need about 200 million to, to build our um, kind of our, our prototype demonstration facility. So, about 200 million compared to, to billions. Sounds a lot, but it's pretty reasonable. So it goes back to our mission of being net gain plus commercially viable and cost effective. Sorry, okay. So a couple things you need, you need in order to do fusion, you've got to create a, a basically donor shape or compact torus of plasma, right? Uh, plasma gas heated to higher temperatures, and we want to create this um, this plasma in a donor shape. Problem with that is that plasma is kind of like a, a smoke ring. No one can blow a Low smoke ring, it kind of stays as a nice circle for a while, but quickly it just kind of fades and disappears. It's not the same problem with the plasma, it disappears in a fraction of a second. So getting the plasma to, uh, the first challenge is creating the plasma, getting it in its kind of donut shape, and getting it to last in that shape long enough to impact it is one of the challenges that you know, we, have to, we have to overcome. Uh, second challenge is, is basically keeping that plasma there long enough to, to, uh, to compress it and, and get it to that heat for the fusion conditions, 140 degrees Celsius. So this, this definitely isn't easy. Um, I'll talk about how we do that in a second. So kind of just let this run a couple times and then I'll talk through it. So. So what we have here, tubes here are what we call our plasma injectors that form this plasma donut, inject it into our sphere, which is here, so here's the plasma injectors, they're injecting the plasma from top and bottom into the middle of this sphere. In the middle of this sphere we have a, a vortex of liquid lead and lithium being pumped around, and the plasma goes into the middle of that vortex, and right when it's in there we fire off these pistons, the pistons hit the sphere at exactly the same time basically dump their energy, uh, collapse that vortex, and that collapsing vortex compresses the fusion fuel, hopefully to fusion conditions. So at the moment we can get our plasma to 4 million degrees Celsius, and our technology path is by compressing that plasma uh, with that amount of energy that quickly will, will increase the temperature, hopefully to fusion conditions. So that's what we're, we're trying to do. The neutrons would then be absorbed by the liquid lead lithium and pumped around basically the heat exchanger system. So we've kind of built in that a system for capturing the energy and then creating a power plant. Uh, you can see the size and the scale here. You know, it's not, not like a huge nuclear power plant or anything like that. So this is a process called magnetized target fusion. Um, using the gas driver system to compress the pistons, we've got those timings controlled down to literally I think it's five thousandths of a second, you know, basically nanoseconds. So here's our plasma injector. Again, we built this in Burnaby. It's there in our facility. It's getting the plasma to 4 million degrees Celsius. Uh, we built a few of these. And so what we're trying to do, our approach is, is trying to develop all the subsystems. We want to uh, build our plasma injector, show that we can get the, the compact torus and the stone shape to last long enough. We're building the, the compression chamber, those piston systems, to show that we can control the timing and the impact and get the symmetrical uh, impact so that the compression uh, creates an acoustic shock wave to collapse that vortex. And we want to show that we've got the system to get the heat and energy out of that plant uh, as well. So, just shows you a, basically a measurement of our uh, plasma being formed here and, and injected into the, uh, into the vortex. So, uh, these are our pistons, so stainless steel. Um, the, the reactor that we Power plant or the components we built at the moment, uh, the sphere is about one million, one meter uh, in, in uh, uh, diameter, full scale would be three million. So at the moment we have 14 pistons. When we scale it up, we want to have 200 pistons to get that, that pressure. So what we're trying to do is just show the laws of physics that if we scale it up, you know, if we get 14 pistons working and getting this temperature, we keep scaling up and you know, show that we can get to fusion conditions. Uh, and this is our, this is the sphere, this is the vortex here, liquid lead lithium in the middle of the, the, uh, the sphere, inject the, the plasma, and then fire off the pistons, and they impact out their energy and collapse them. Okay. 
just again showing, showing our, our progress and our approach was all about the plasma ejector getting the right temperature density lifetime, uh, the pistons, the vortex, and that uh, plasma compression. So, you know, we started way back here with just this idea on paper, this technology. People said we couldn't do it. They said you never get the uh, temperature. We achieved that. You don't get the density. We achieved that. We won't be able to control the pistons the time. And step by step, we made it. So when you look at you know, why all this hype about general fusion now is because we started in 2002. People thought Michelle was crazy. Even four or five years later, they still thought he was crazy. And he starts you know, demonstrating this, you know, and having people in to see it and validate it and, and test it. And we're hitting these milestones you know, faster than they didn't even think we'd be able to achieve them in the first place. So we took them all in the long run, and we're getting closer and closer. So um, and that's why we've got these aggressive time scales. So we've done that. Then the concept of the principle, we're uh, developing the subsystem prototypes, and we want to get to break energy in the next two to three years, and then from there, you know, into an alpha plant, et cetera. So um, pretty, pretty amazing for fusion energy. Yeah, and you know, again, if you achieve this, it literally changes the world, right? It's probably one of the, be like Ford Motor Company, General Electric, would be one of the world's most known motor companies. So pretty exciting. So you can just imagine, right? Michelle was a you know scientist, worked with Creole products, pretty cool. We've got lucky cash in this money, decides to start fusion, everyone thought he was crazy, and he made all this progress. Government money, Sonobus Energy, Jeff Bezos, uh, we're on the cover of Canadian Business Magazine this month. We've been on Fortune magazine, design engineering, uh, CBC like you know, literary show, all these credibility stages. And then one day I was out of work and thinking, oh you know, we should put an application to TED Talk. You know, you'll never be selected for that. That's kind of Google and Bill Gates and all those people. Send the application, get a phone call from TED Talk. They want us to speak at TED uh, on the same day as Bill Gates, um, you know, a bunch of other these heavy hitters. So Michelle gave a TED Talk a few weeks ago. It's now online, and like I said, it's hit about. Uh, well, to, so when I left the office, we were up to 50,000 hits. We're now at 88,000, so another 38,000 uh, since I've been here. Wow, this is bright. Must use a lot of power. <laughs> well, flying you all in here must have cost a bit of energy too. So the whole planet needs a lot of energy. And so far, we've been running mostly on fossil fuel. We've been burning gas. Been a good run. It got us to where we are, but we have to stop. We can't do that anymore. So we are trying different type of uh, energy, now alternative energy. But it proved quite difficult to find something that's as convenient and as cost-effective as oil, gas, and coal. My personal favorite is nuclear energy. Now, it's very energy-dense, it produces solid, reliable power, and it doesn't make any CO2. Now, we know of two ways of making uh, nuclear energy, fission and fusion. Now, in fission, you take a big nucleus, you break it in part in two, and makes lots of energy. And this is how the nuclear reactor today works. Works pretty good. And then there's fusion. Now, I like fusion. Fusion is much better. So you take two small nucleus, you put it together, and you make helium. And that's very nice. Makes lots of energy. This is nature's way of producing energy. The sun and all the stars in the universe run on fusion. Now, a fusion plant would actually be quite cost effective, and it also would be quite safe. It uh, only uh, produces short-term radioactive waste, and it cannot melt down. Now, the fuel from fusion comes from the ocean. In the ocean, you can extract the fuel for about one thousandth of a cent per kilowatt hour. So that's very, very cheap. And if the whole planet would run on fusion, it would run, we could extract the fuel from the ocean, and it would run for billions and billions of years. Now, if fusion is so great, why don't we have it? Where is it? Well, there's always a bit of a catch. Fusion is really, really hard to do. So the problem is those two nucleus, they're both positively charged, so they don't, they don't want to fuse. They go like this, they go like that. So in order to make them fuse, you have to throw them at each other with great speed. And if they have enough speed, they will go against the repulsion, they will touch, and they'll make energy. Now, the, t the particle uh, speed is a measure of the temperature. So the temperature required for fusion is 150 million degrees C. This is rather warm, and this is why fusion is so hard to do. 
Now, I caught my little fusion bug when I did my PhD here at the University of British Columbia. And then I get a big job in a laser printer place making uh, printing for the printing industry. I worked there for, you know, 10 years, and I got a little bit bored. And then I was 40, and I got a middle-life crisis. You know, the usual thing, who am I? What should I do? What should I do? What can I do? And then I was looking at my uh, good work, and what I was doing is I was cutting the forest around here in BC and burying you, all of you, in millions of tons of junk mail. Now, that was not very satisfactory. So some people buy a Porsche, other, you know, get a mistress, but I've decided to get my bit to sell, solve uh, global warming and make fusion happen. Now, so the first thing I did is I look into the literature and I see how does fusion work. So, the physicists have been working on fusion for a while, and one of the ways they do it is with uh, something called a tokamak. It's a big ring of magnetic coil, superconducting coil, and makes a magnetic field in a, in a ring like this. And the hot gas in the middle, which is called a plasma, is trapped. The particles go round and round and round the circle and the wall. Then they throw a huge amount of heat in there to try to cook that to fusion temperature. So this is the inside of one of those donuts, and on the right side, you can see the fusion uh, plasma in there. Now, a second way of doing this is uh, by using laser fusion. Now, in laser fusion, you have a little ping-pong ball. You put the fusion fuel in the center, and you zap that with a whole bunch of laser around it. The laser are very strong, and it squashes the big ball, ball really, really quick. And if you squeeze something hard enough, it gets hotter. And if it gets really, really fast, and you do that in one billionth of a second, it makes enough energy and enough heat to make fusion. So this is the inside of one such machine. You see the laser beam and the pellet in the center. Now, most people think that fusion is going nowhere. They always think that the physicists are in their lab and they're working hard, but nothing is happening. That's actually not quite true. This is a curve of the gain in fusion over the last 30 years or so, and you can see that we're making now about 10,000 times more fusion than we used to when we started. That's a pretty good gain. As a factor of fact, it's as fast as the fable Moore's law that uh, define the amount of transistor they can put on a chip. Now, this dot here, is called JET, the Joint European Torus. That's a big tokamak donut in Europe. And this machine, in 1997, produced 16 megawatt of fusion power with 17 megawatt of heat. Now, you see, that's not much useful, but it's actually pretty close, considering we can get about 10,000 times more than we started. The second dot here is the NIF, is the National Ignition Facility. It's a big laser machine in the US, and last month they announced with uh, quite a bit of noise, that they managed to make more fusion energy from the, the fusion than the energy that they put in the center of the ping-pong ball. Now, that's not quite good enough, because the laser to put that energy in was more energy than that, but uh, it was pretty good. Now, this is ITER, pronounced in French, ITER. So this is a big collaboration of uh, different countries that are building a huge magnetic donut in the south of France, and this machine, when it's finished, will produce 500 megawatt of fusion power with only 50 megawatt to make it. So this one is the real one. It's going to work. This is going to machine that makes energy. Now, if you look at the graph, you will notice that those two dots, they're a little bit on the right of the curve. We kind of have fallen off the progress. Actually, the science to make those machines was ready in time to produce uh, fusion during that curve. However, there's been a bit of politics going on, and the will to do it was not there, so it drifted to the right. ITER, for example, could have been built in 2000 or 2005, but because it's a big international collaboration, the politics got in and it delayed it a bit. For example, it takes them about three years to decide where to put it. Now, fusion is often criticized for being a little too expensive. Yes, it did cost, you know, a billion dollar or two billion dollar a year to make this progress, but you have to compare that to the cost of making the Moore's Law. That costs way more than that. The result of the Moore's Law is this cell phone here in my pocket. This cell phone and the internet behind it cost about $1 trillion. Just so I can take a selfie, <laughs> I can put it on Facebook. Then when my dad sees that, he'll be very proud. <laughs> we also spend about $650 billion a year in subsidies for oil and gas and renewable energy. Now, we spend one half of a percent of that on fusion. So me, personally, I don't think it's too expensive. I think it's actually been short-changed, considering it can solve all of our uh, energy problems cleanly for the next couple of billions of years. 
Now, I can say that, but I'm a little bit biased because I started a fusion company and I don't even have a Facebook account. So, so when I started this fusion company in 2002, uh, I knew I couldn't fight with the big labs. They had much more resources than me. So I decided I need to find a solution that is cheaper and faster. Now, magnetic and laser fusion are pretty good machine. They are some piece of technology, wonderful machine, and they have shown that fusion can be done. However, as a power plant, I don't think they're very good. They're way too big, way too complicated, way too expensive. And also, they don't deal very much with the fusion energy. When you make fusion, the energy comes out as neutron. Fast neutron comes out of the plasma. Those neutrons hit the wall of the machine. It damages it. And also, you have to catch the heat from those neutrons, run some steam to spin a turbine somewhere. And on those machines, it was all a bit of an afterthought. So I decided that surely there's a better way of doing that. So back to the literature, and I read about the fusion everywhere. One way in particular attract my attention, and it's called magnetized target fusion, or MTF for short. Now, in MTF, what you want to do is you take a big vat and you fill that with liquid metal and you spin the liquid metal to open a vortex in the center, you know, a bit like your sink when you pull the plug on a sink, it makes a vortex. And then you have some piston driven by pressure that goes on the outside and this compresses the liquid metal around the plasma and it compresses it, gets hotter like laser and then it makes fusion. So it's a bit of a mix between a magnetized fusion and the laser fusion. So those have a couple of very good advantage. The liquid metal absorbs all the neutrons, and no neutrons hit the wall, and therefore there's no damage to the machine. The liquid metal gets hot, so you can pump that in the heat exchanger, make some steam, spin a turbine. So that's a very convenient way of doing this part of the process. And finally, uh, all the energy to make the fusion happen comes from steam power piston, which is way cheaper than laser or superconducting coil. Now, this was all very good, except for the problem that it didn't quite work. <laughs> it's always a catch. So when you compress that, the plasma cools down faster than the compression speed. So you're trying to compress it, but the plasma cools down and cools down and cools down, and then it did absolutely nothing. So when I saw that, I said, well, this is such a shame because it's a very, very good idea. So hopefully I can improve on that. So I thought about it for a minute, and I said, okay, how can we make that work better? So then I thought about impact. What about we use a big hammer, and we swing it and we hit the, the nail like this. In place of putting the hammer on the nail and pushing and trying to put it in, that, that won't work. So what the idea is, is to use the idea of an impact. So we accelerate the piston with steam, that takes a little bit of time, but then bang, hit the piston, and paf, all the energy is done instantly, download instantly into the liquid, and that compresses the plasma much faster. So I decided, okay, this is good, let's make that. So we build this machine uh, in this garage. Here we make a small machine that we managed to squeeze a little bit of neutron out of that. And those are my marketing neutron. And with those marketing neutron, then I raised about $50 million. And I hired 65 people. That's my team here. And this is what we want to build. So it's going to be a big machine, about three meters in diameter, liquid lead spinning around, big vortex in the center, put the plasma on the top and on the bottom, piston hit on the side, bang, it compresses it. And it will make some energy. The neutron will come out in the liquid metal going to go in a steam engine and make the turbine, and some of the steam will go back to fire the piston. We're going to run that about one time per second, and this will produce 100 megawatt of electricity. OK, we also build this injector. So this injector makes the plasma to start with. It makes the plasma at about a lukewarm temperature of 3 million degrees C. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it doesn't last quite long enough. So uh, we need to extend the life of the plasma a little bit. But uh, last month, it got a lot better. So I think we have the plasma was uh, compressing now. Then we build this small sphere, about this big, 14 pistons around it. And uh, this will compress the liquid. However, plasma is difficult to compress. When you compress it, it tends to go a little bit crooked like that. So you need the timing of the piston to be very good. And for that, we use a servo control system, which was not possible in 1970. But we now can do that with a nice new electronic. So finally, most people think that fusion is in the future and will never happen. But as a matter of fact, fusion is getting very close. We're almost there. The big lab have showed that fusion is doable. And now there's small company that are thinking about that. And they say, it's not that it cannot be done, but it's all to make it cost effectively. General Fusion is one of those small companies. And hopefully, very soon, somebody, someone will crack that nut. And perhaps it'll be General Fusion. Thank you very much.
that's it. Uh, so hopefully that's going to be a quick overview of fusion. Fusion is coming, probably in a case of when, not if. And general fusion is trying to do it before anywhere else we're basing further. So uh, I'll leave it at that for tonight. Thank you very much, Alex.